Bible Church for all your new visitors. This is our weekly events. We have the weekly Bible studies. Men's and women's are on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. The men's is at the Bible Shack in Woods, and the women's is here. And then Friday morning, there's a women's Bible study at 9.30 here. And Wednesday night, we have a prayer meeting. It's also a short Bible study, and then we have prayers together of, the, of our community's needs, the nation's needs, each other's needs. We hold each other and the body together by prayer. We look forward to having more people attend. Uh, this morning, we're starting without a pastor, and maybe he shows up by the time we get three songs. He's on a call right now, so we hope him to be back. He's supposed to come. Oh, oh okay. Well, you've never heard that from me. If you please stand and join with us. Father, we thank you for this day, for this you have brought us to. You continually bless us. We thank you for this body that we may gather together, that we can honor you, that we can worship you, that our hearts will turn towards you to this service and our ears will open to hear your message. Watch over Dan and the people he went to console. May they be well when this is done, may your will be done in what has happened. Lord, we thank you for this, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
cross. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. We're going to be out of Genesis for maybe the next two or three weeks. And so Genesis chapter 17, um, we're going to wrap up, Lord willing, this morning. Um, I don't know if Mark uh, let you guys know or not. I, I had to run to a chaplain call out this morning and... Um, 
just the family asked me the the asked me if I would be in prayer for them. She specifically asked that our church pray for them today. So uh, can't go into any detail besides that, but I would like to pray for them right now. Um, our Father God, thank you, thank you that in in great great times of trial. Lord, you are, you are so present. Lord, I rejoice in the fact that there is a God who truly cares and brings comfort in difficult times. So God, I pray for these friends and this family. And I ask for your encouragement and your blessing on them today, Lord, in their grief. Lord, truly, you are the God of all comfort, and we have every reason in the world to rest in you. So, Father, I pray that you would do the work that we're incapable of doing in the life of this family today. And God, be with us as we turn our attention to your word and seek to understand in a more clear way who our God is. That, Lord, we would be sanctified greatly, more sanctified in our time in your word, and you would be more glorified in our lives, Lord. Not that we draw more glory to you, but we recognize how glorious you really, really are. And so bless this time, Father, as we, as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would turn with me to Romans chapter 4, I'm going right back to Genesis 17, but Romans chapter 4, verse 18. I want to set this as kind of the backdrop to uh, our passage this morning. We read this last week. I read the whole chapter last week, but I just want to read this portion now as we kind of, um, as we begin. So, Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Speaking of Abraham. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now catch this, guys. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. <coughs> Fully convinced, it's worth underlining, that God was able to do what he had promised. Fully convinced God's, God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now, if you turn back to Genesis chapter 17... We're kind of in the middle, uh, kind of a, not a crossroad, but kind of an intersection here on this chapter. Because last week we saw chapter 17, verses 1 to 14, and saw exactly what the Lord was coming and promising to Abram. If you remember right, uh, last week I gave this image of a, of a lens. And a wider lens, so that way it was clearer to the people who were seeing it. As God comes to Abram and says basically... Come away from your people, come out of your land, come to land I'll show you, and I'll make a great nation out of you. Okay, how? My wife can't have kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll cover that. <laughs> Just follow me, uh, and, uh, and I'll take care of the rest. Now, think about the statement I just made, and think about your life as a Christian. Just follow me, and I'll take care of the rest. Just walk in obedience, and I'll take care of the rest. Just hear what I said in my word, do it unflinchingly, and I've got your back. Now, I can say that, and we all go amen, and, and we're all comfy with that, but it's not our life yet. 
Uh, it, it's not our life that we see here with Abram. This is his life. And the fact is, all of us struggle a bit at times, often, putting that foot forward and trusting God. I mean, cut through the fat a little bit and just be honest with yourself. What's really the issue here? The real issue is, I don't trust him. Do you have reasons to trust him? Of course they have reasons to trust him. Has he, has he shown himself faithful to you? All day long. So then do you trust him? Of course I trust him. Didn't you see my theological exam I took? I trust him. Well, then wait 10 years. I can't wait 10 years. Is there a Hagar in the house? And can we go after that? Yeah. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You trusted him. And he did. Beloved, don't miss, don't miss me on this. He did trust the Lord. He does trust the Lord. He left his family. He's going after a land he's never seen. Expecting a child from a wife that's barren. I mean, obviously, there's trust mingled with that struggle all of us have where we say, Maybe I'll help God. Well, in God in his grace, and I mean that with all of my heart, God graciously widens the lens slowly and says, I'm going to allow you to see with a little, a little greater clarity my plan for you. I think if you were to give him the whole picture when he was in the era of Chaldees, Abram just would have been flabbergasted. And if he would have had the entire picture, there wouldn't be a whole lot of faith involved and trust in God's character. But a lot of time has passed, and he is just about to become a centurion. And so God comes to him and is giving him a much wider lens and a much clearer picture of what's happening. And last week we saw the, the uh, God telling him what he was going to accomplish through Abram. And this covenant of circumcision, the sign of this covenant he's making with him, but there's another piece of the story, and it's an interesting piece of the story because it's a piece that we haven't heard much about up to this point. And that's God's promise for Abram to have a son who would be his heir and other nations would come from him is not through Hagar. That's not God's plan. It's never been God's plan. It has always been the design, always been the plan since day one that Sarah would be the mother of this line, the wife of Abraham. And so that's where we pick up now with the lens getting even further out. Verse 15, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now, you can't read too much into the name change. Now, as we talked about last week, that concept of the name change, first and foremost, is about authority. The authority that Almighty God has on this family, on this couple. As he changed Abram's name, now he changes Sarah's name. Now, Abram went from exalted father to father of multitudes. Sarai to Sarah is basically the same thing in a different dialect, but it means princess. That's important. I'll, sh I'll, I'll share why in just a little bit. But there's not a massive change in the meaning like we saw with Abraham last week. It's your exalted dad. But now you're a dad of multitudes, which made sense with the covenant promise that he was giving to Abram anyways. So Sarah, you're going to be a princess. You'll continue to be a princess. And by the way, you're the princess. You're the one that God has designed to be part of this covenant promise. God's authority over Sarah is seen in this name change. Remember I gave that illustration last week. If I were to change your child's name, you would really wonder how I'm, where I come off, thinking I have the authority to change the name of your child. You can't do that. We already named our kid. You don't have that authority over them. You don't have that place in his life to do that. Almighty God does. God says what he wants. God does what he wants. Now, there's two pieces here. There's the piece of God has authority in the name change, but also God is foretelling or telling what's going to be coming out from that person by their name change. The meaning of the name is kind of a, it's kind of like a summation of what's going to happen, of what's coming forward. And so Almighty God says, no longer will you call her Sarai, but you'll call her Sarah. 
Please notice your wife. You will never see God call Hagar his wife. And you will never once see, even though there is a promise to Hagar about Ishmael and nations coming from Ishmael, you will never see God connect the Abrahamic covenant to Ishmael, the two separate things. Why is that important? Well, it's important um, further in history, but in this moment, I think it's also very important because God's not validating what they did with Hagar. God is not saying, thank you for helping me. Thank you for assisting me in this. No. Ishmael is not the child of the covenant. Hagar is not a part of this covenant. Abram, I came to you, I called you out, I promised you a nation, and I never once told you to leave your wife and go to another woman to try to make this work. Why? I want you to trust me, even in the impossible, I want you to trust me. But now let me, let me rephrase that. In the perceived impossible. And I'm not beating up on Abram. How would you feel? What would you think? I'd be going, I don't think so. That's not going to work. Now the Lord pours out these blessings on Sarai, guys. Look, look at your Bibles with me. Verse 16. He says, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples, remember princess, kings come from princesses, kings of peoples shall come from her. So there's great blessings here. Number one, I will bless her. So the very blessing of God is on this woman. She will have a son. I love the phrase, I will give her a son. She's, they're not, not doing this out of the scope of God's grace. This is all under the banner of his grace. I'll give you a son. I'll allow you to have a son. You've been bearing up to this whole point, but now I, in my grace, will allow this to be, and I will give you a son. Nations will come from her. Now remember, 90, 90 years old, nations will come from you. Kings will come from Sarah. We'll see a group of kings come through this line. This is God's sovereign work. And again, as I shared last week, you guys, if you look at your Bible, I encourage you to do this. You don't have to, but it helps my eyes. Every time I come back to Genesis chapter 17 and my eyes fall on my Bible in red to underline, I will, every time God says it. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. That's so important because... So often, and I don't know about you, but I'm more of a doer. I don't like to wait. I'm not good at waiting. I'm more of an impatient type fella. And, and so I, I want something to do. And here God is telling Abram over and over, and Sarah over and over, I will do this. You will not do this. I will accomplish this. The main thing, the, the big hub of what I'm calling you, Abram, and you, Sarah, to do is trust me to do it. Now, there's definitely a task as far as the, the sign of the covenant that is on Abram here, and I'm not neglecting that. I'm just saying as far as the miracle work is concerned, as far as the covenant is concerned, this is God reassuring them, telling them, don't forget who God is. I'm accomplishing this around you. Trust. Trust me. Those I, those I wills have been some of the, the sweetest fruit of the study for me in this passage. I love Put me back on my heels and say, okay, I forgot. You're God. <laughs> I'm not. I need to rest in your sovereign, gracious will, in your omniscience, in your omnipotence, I have forgotten you are God, and those I wills is him saying over and over and over again, I am the king, you are the subject, I am the God, you are the worshiper, I am the sovereign, you are the one who worships and follows and serves the sovereign. Which brings all kinds of mixed responses, because 
there's, there's a natural response where in our will we want to say, not me, I'm not subject to anybody. Well, that's called sin and a rebellious will from our father Adam that's in our hearts. That's one response. Another response, and I pray it's your response, is you go, I am so glad I'm not in charge. You imagine if Dan was in charge? How horrible that would be? Amen. How out of control things would be? How out of proportion things would be? It'd be horrific. A Dan world. Good luck with that. But an absolute, perfect, wise, holy, all-powerful, sovereign king filled with grace and the most just, truly just, is in control. That should bring a calming over our, our minds, our bodies, our emotions. Okay. Okay. You're in charge. Now, the interesting part that I love so much is that when I say you're in charge, I'm actually not telling him he's in charge. He's already in charge. <laughs> it's just between my ears that's in agreement with what's real. It's not me saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to let go and give you the controls. God's going, I have the controls. I'm just waiting for you to catch on. Okay, yes, Lord. But in my heart, in my heart, I thought I had my hands on the wheel. I know I didn't, but I thought I did. And it feels so good to recognize I don't. And I can trust you completely with this. Well, let's look at Abraham's reaction because it's classic. Then Abram fell on his face. That guy loves being down there when he's before the Lord. And so he should. Because that is a place of reverence. That is a place of recognition of who the Lord is. It's a place of recognition of who Abram, uh, Abraham is. When you come in, pre in the presence of the holy, the response of fallen man who is redeemed is to fall upon the face. Sovereign God of the universe, I should not even look upon you. But there's another thing added here. Earlier, you saw in, earlier in the chapter, he fell on his face before the Lord in humble adoration, as the same thing I think he's doing here. But let me ask you this. Number one, have you ever been given something or been informed of a piece of news that was so over the top, you're either going to cry or you're going to laugh? You just, you just couldn't believe. I had, I had uh, a good friend of mine one time surprise me. He wouldn't tell me where we were going. We were, this is when I was in Eastern Oregon, and we were going over to, to Idaho, and we went over into Idaho, and he hadn't told me anything of why we were doing this. And then he hands me two tickets to see B.B. King live. Now, to some of you, you'd go, oh, that's torture. <laughs> to a blues guitar player, I was, I was blown away. And I couldn't do anything but laugh. Because it just seemed so unreal. Because he parked in front of where B.B. was playing. He said, we're going to go in there and we're going to go hear him play. And I just, I couldn't believe this person, and particularly this individual, couldn't believe they would do that. I remember just laughing, looking at the tickets, and I said, okay, that's crazy, but let's go. It was a great concert. There are times in our lives where we are so overwhelmed, we can't even believe it. Now, it's not, this is the interesting part, and this is what I'm convinced of by this passage, guys. It's not unbelief where Abram is saying, you can't do that, God. You're incapable of doing that. I don't think it's that. I think it's, it's, it's a disbelief in the sense that it is so far beyond reason, so off the charts logically, <laughs> all he can do is laugh. There's no way. I'm a hundred years old. As one woman told me that he was old and Sarah was advanced in years. There's a vast difference between the two. None of us can get on this guy for laughing at the response. And now what, he, what comes out of his mouth as far as his response to the Lord is telling that he truly is struggling with this. This is so off the charts, Lord. I don't know what to do with this. 
But the reason I wanted you to read Romans 4 before we came to this passage was the passage says he never wavered in his trust. And I, I don't believe he's wavering in his trust here. I think he's truly just seeking to work it through his system of, God, what are you, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you, what are you laying out in front of me here? So on his face, you can all picture him, can't you? Here's this 99-year-old dude on his, on his face before God, and his body starts shaking, and he's just laughing to himself. Abram fell on his face, verse 17, and laughed and said to himself, please notice, to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. I don't know about you, but... When, when something is brought into view and there's something going on and somebody brings something up to me and it seems absolutely outlandish and there's no way, my brain, the way it functions typically, is to look at some other secondary thing that makes more sense that will really work, right? It's like, oh, it's going to be this way, Dan. Um, when we go home today after church... You close your eyes, click your heels, say there's no place like home, and then you're going to pick up and you're going to be carried off to your house. My first mind, but I got a car right there. Right? That's outlandish. Of course it's not. It's, I'm not going to fly home. I'm, I'm going to go out there, start the car, and then I'll drive home. My brain thinks like that. Everybody's brain thinks like that. Abraham's brain was, may Ishmael live before you. He's alive. He's 13 right now. He's, you know, he's... He's, he's being born, um, he was born, remember that Hagar came back, Hagar is now living with us, Ishmael is now living with us, Ishmael truly is my son, Abram's, Abraham's son, so Lord, may he live before you as the one who you will make covenant with and who you will bring nations through. It's kind of like he, he's pitching this idea back to the Lord, oh, you said a son, well, and I know you said Sarah, but shall Sarah have a kid? Shall I have a kid with Sarah? Of course not. So may Ishmael live before you. Now, if there's one statement in this text that keeps coming back over and over and over to me, it's this. God said no. <laughs> now, I know he says more after that. But, but God says uh, no. No. That word must have struck Abram. Because Abram, in his mind, in his heart, says, may Ishmael live before you. May Ishmael be the, the child of this covenant you've made with me. Of course he will, Lord. God said, no. You won't change the plan, Abram. You will not throw off this plan. You will not throw off this design, I am God, you are not God, you are not accomplishing this, I'm accomplishing this. And let me remind you, beloved, that God has, in his infinite mind, selected this exact time for Isaac to be born. It's not that things tripped up God and God wasn't sure what to do when Isaac would be born. No, no, no. He'll be born to this old man and this old woman on purpose that God's glory might be seen in this event. Much like the disciples with the blind man, did this man sin or did this man's parents sin? No, he was blind from birth so that the power of God, the glory of God, would be seen through his light. So you ask the question, you go, God, why'd you wait so long? Because I'm going to show my glory through you. I don't show my glory and my power through your strength. I throw it, show it through your weakness. I want to see you weak. I want to see you old, Abram, so that everybody goes, not a chance could that guy have kids. With that barren woman who's 90 years old, and nations came from them. And the only answer is, there is a God in heaven. So his reaction here, I, I sympathize with his response. But the Lord, Almighty God, shows that he actually has chosen covenant partners. If you look with me, know that Sarah, your wife, please notice again, 
He's reiterating this phrase, your wife. She's your wife, Abram. She's the wife of your youth. She's the one you will have this child through. Your wife shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. Please notice again that theme is everywhere throughout your Bible where God names the gift, the gifted child. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Please notice offspring. And I just encourage you to jot down Galatians 3 in the margin of your Bible. Go there and look at what Paul has to say about the title offspring. Because I believe this is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, the offspring of Isaac. Yeah, he's going to have kids who will have kids who will have kids. But there is an offspring singular who will come and be the fulfillment of this covenant. As for Ishmael, now this is a very, very, very fascinating to me. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Now remember, his name, Ishmael's name is God hears or God heard. And so there's a play on words here. As for God hears, I heard you. God's grace is still here for Ishmael. Now remember, we saw earlier that his plan and purpose for Ishmael is Ishmael's going to be a wild donkey of a man, and he's going to be in a complete, he's going to be a violent man and always at fighting and wars with other people. That's the history, and we've seen that. If we look behind us, we can see that history from Ishmael and from his brood. But nonetheless, that promise still remains to Hagar. I will remember you. I will make a great nation come from you. Look, look what the text says. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish, and verse 21, guys, really is a summation of everything God's communicating here. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you, Abraham, at this time next year. Year. What a mouthful in one verse. In one verse, all this time, beloved, that you go all the way back to chapter 12, where God comes to Abram and says, Leave your people, and I want you to come to this land I'll show you. And everything that we have had in between there and here, that one verse really summarizes the whole thing going on here. God's plan. He's widening that lens that they might see his divine plan. Let me read it one more time. Verse 21. But I, God, will establish my covenant with Isaac, not Ishmael, whom Sarah, your wife, and I know I'm reading into it, shall bear to you, even though she cannot have children, she will bear to you, Abraham, you will be the father at this time next year. In a year, Abram, you are going to see a kid come from you and from your wife. That kid is the one that I promised to you. He is the recipient of this covenant. The children that come from him are the recipients of this covenant. I am going to accomplish all this before your very eyes. Now, up to this point, God has said, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. One of the first times where he says, in a year. I don't know about you, if somebody tells me, hey Dan, I've got a Harley Davidson for you. Really? Yeah, I'm going to give it to you. When? I'll give it to you. Okay, what, but when? When I give it to you. Five years pass, 10 years pass, 15 years pass, 20 years pass. Okay, Dan, now that you're 99, here you go. Vroom, vroom, good luck with that. But when somebody, especially when it's Almighty God, says, this time next year, you will see a miracle before your very eyes by my power. And the promise I promised you that brought you away from your family, you're going to start to see this unfold right in front of you. Your faith, now this is, this is what's so beautiful, your faith will partially become sight. So, I can't help but think, what, what was that year like? The expectation and the joy and the, I don't know. I don't know. But 
if you underline in your Bible or write in the margins, verse 21 really is a summation, beloved, of this, of this whole event. Let me uh, turn to this last bit of this chapter and draw our attention to the Lord's Supper. I titled this portion, The Unflinching Obedience. I don't know about you, but the sign of the covenant and who receives the sign of the covenant would make for a very interesting conversation among Abram and his family and his servants to explain to them, I need to, I need to do this sign of the covenant to you. Why? God said so. God said so. Yeah. Um, and I want to put this sign in your flesh because God said so. Look at verse 22. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abram. What that means, I'm not quite sure as far as when the Lord's presence was there, when his presence was gone, what exactly the manifestation was, but it was apparent to Abram, God now had gone. And Abram knows his marching orders. He's not second-guessing in any way, shape, or form. Then Abram took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. That is one of the best, most beautiful phrases in Genesis. That very day. Delayed, obedient, delayed obedience is disobedience. God says, do it. I'll get around to it. You know, a parent says, I need you to stack the wood. Go out and stack the wood. Three weeks later, you didn't stack the wood. Ted, I'm going to get to it. That goes over well, doesn't it? <laughs> God says, Abram, sign of the covenant. Every male, do that. That very day, unflinching, immediate, response to the word of God. That's what he calls me to do, and that's what I do. Period. Now, reason with me a little bit, guys. Think, think carefully with me, and just think about our nature. Do you think there was any conversation between Abram, his servants, his, his son Ishmael, all the people in his home, all the males, every single male there, let me give you an argument that I think I could pose to him if I was in that camp. I would say, Abram, don't you realize that if we do that, you take every single warrior out of commission for a while? Who's going to protect us? Are you sure God wants us that? God, God wants us protected, right? You're taking every ounce of protection away from us. Abraham's response? Yeah, except, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? God. So let's walk in obedience and trust him. He'll protect us. He'll guard us. He said to do it. Do it. Walk in obedience to the living God. I, I love that phrase. That very day. Done. That very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. That's vital to Paul's argument in Romans 4. I'll let you chase that. Circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in all the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. He did not flinch in his obedience to the Lord. And so let me just touch down on a couple points of application for you to think about. We must learn to trust God at his word alone. I, I, the, this whole series of looking at, at Father Abraham, that has been a ringing crescendo over and over and over again in this study. Learning to trust the Lord at his word alone. God's word says it. I have every reason to trust him. I have every reason to walk in obedience to his word. Yeah, but the culture doesn't accept it. I don't care. Yeah, but your own natural response to it, you don't really buy it. I don't care. Yeah, but there's people all over that they, they, they're telling you that that's kind of strange for you to walk in obedience to what you see in the word. I don't care. His word says it. I walk in obedience to it. That very 
day he walked in obedience. When he, beloved, when you see something from the word of God and you see it clearly within its context, you believe that is the truth of the Bible and you see something in your life that's out of sync with it, that very day. Lord, I want change. I want to walk in obedience to you. And please, please, don't, don't miss me here. I am not in any way saying, therefore, Abram was justified before God by his works. Of course not. He already believed on God to his credit him as righteousness. The works flow from the faith. The salvation does not flow from the works. Faith, justification, works flow for. It's not that he did it, the circumcision here, and God says, okay, now he's justified. No, 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 no. Now, this is the entire point of Paul in Romans 4. He was justified way before he ever did that. By what? By faith. At times when God's word may seem contrary even to our own understanding of the circumstances, don't you think, beloved, that God may have a better grasp on your circumstances than you may? We must walk in obedience to him and trust in the fact that he is God, and I am not. And I would just simply point to you, Noah building a boat, no water. Abram moving to a land, he doesn't know where he's going, with a kid coming from a wife who's barren when he's 100 years old. Daniel stepping into a lion's den, one way or the other, God is in sovereign control, and I trust him. Don't pray. Okay, I'll open the windows to pray. And then Daniel's three friends being thrown into the furnace, saying, our God is fully capable to rescue us. But even if he does not, we will not worship your image. We will serve the Lord. Beloved, faith, the assurance of things that you, you don't see it, but you know it. You know it clearly. You have every reason to trust it. And so as we do turn our attention to serve the Lord's Supper, here's the word that I want to just give to you this morning from this passage. And it flows perfectly because the promise to Adam and Eve that the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent, the promise to Abram that from you will come this offspring and we'll see that that offspring ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, there is salvation in no other name. That's what all of this Old Testament history is driving towards, salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. And so here's my charge to you this morning. I challenge you with this. Rest in the grace of God in Jesus Christ. I don't know. I think on paper, probably most all of us would write down salvation is by grace through faith, but that not of ourselves, <coughs> but in Christ, faith in Christ. But it's amazing how fast works righteousness can creep in, and we can think that I've made God happier, and I've gotten myself, a, I've paid him back some by my good life. Can I inform you, you haven't paid him back a dime. <coughs> You are bankrupt spiritually and in need of the perfection of Jesus Christ. There is no righteousness apart from his righteousness before God. Even the good deeds that we do now are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to maybe, maybe just loosen your grip a little bit freshly recognize that you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Find rest for your soul, the true rest that flows from it. For there's no rest anywhere else. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. There is rest in no other than the Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we, as we draw chapter 17 to a conclusion today, by no means have we seen everything that is in that passage. But Lord, I pray that we have grown perhaps a greater familiarity with this. 
Father, as this story leads into the even greater story, the meta-narrative of a God redeeming a people through the sending of His Son. Oh, Father, we have every reason to come to you and worship this morning. And as we hold this little cup and take this little piece of bread, Lord, they're mere symbols to draw our attention and our affection straight to Jesus Christ. For, Lord, we are hell-bound and hopeless if we did not have them. And so I thank you, Lord, for my Savior. I thank you for sending forth your Son to lay his life down to rescue Dan, to save him from the penalty of his sin. And in you, Lord, and in you alone, I glory. You are a shield about me. You are my glory. And Father, you are truly the lifter of my head. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John and Vern, would you guys mind help me serve us more, please? You know, it's interesting during the COVID stuff when we weren't gathering, there were a lot, a lot of things that I was missing. This was one of the top on the list, um, having communion with you. That night that our Savior was going to be betrayed, there were this disciple took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Think about that, the Son of the living God. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you. John, would you thank the Lord for his salvation he's given us? Father, we take this bread and we do this in remembrance of you and all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save our souls. Amen. <laughs>
you a certain cup. They said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until his return. Why don't we stand together and, and sing? your name today. We know that you live. You have the, you are the sovereign king. And um, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us not just the faith, but the, the quick obedience that uh, you saw in Abraham. Uh, and as we leave this building, I pray, Lord, that um, your words would just burn in and stay with us. And that we would, uh, Continue and walk in praise with you. In Jesus' name.